The African Development Bank Summit calls for an opening up of African borders. And we'll also be exploring how women are finding a fortune in business in Senegal. Hello there. Welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. I'm Ramanyan. Now, let's pick up where we left off 24 hours ago with the worst fuel crisis Nigeria's had so far. With a deal struck between the government and oil marketers late on Monday, petrol stations have started to gradually reopen. However, that doesn't mean that fuel supplies are back to normal. Motorists are being frustrated by long queues and shortages are going to be a feature of life for a while to come. Despite the end of the fuel strike, Nigerians in the capital city of Lagos continue to feel the impact of chronic shortages. Oil-rich Nigeria has been suffering acute gasoline, diesel and aviation fuel shortages for weeks due to a strike by marketers and distributors over the non-payment of government subsidies. They have now agreed to resume distribution, but it will take a while before things get back to normal as motorists queue for hours at petrol stations. I've been here since 7 o'clock. The night I was coming back from my home, I thought I was selling fuel here, so I had to queue for the fuel. I've been here since 7 o'clock, and since the queue is not moving. Maybe they are attending to all the jerry can, not car alone. Maybe they say one car and buy a five to six jerry can. But I've been here since 7 o'clock here, and I've not even gone anywhere. I don't feel yet. Despite being Africa's biggest oil producer, Nigeria relies heavily on imports due to a lack of adequate refineries. A dilapidated power grid means businesses and households depend on diesel and gasoline generators. We are not happy because of the heat. We are not happy because we cannot even see any light. We are not happy because we are not seeing power to, uh, to pump our water. They should fight their force so that the youth will not react. Very soon, the situation control like this for one week, additional one week, there will be chaos everywhere. The shortages brought phone companies, banks and airlines to a standstill just days ahead of the inauguration of the country's new president, Muhammadu Buhari, on Friday. Stakeholders across the fuel supply chain have been concerned that the incoming government may not pay out the remaining subsidy debt. Marketers claim they are owed around $1 billion in unpaid fuel subsidies. This man that is coming in now, I mean Buhari, before he can really get everything together, it's going to like take a while and because this government now has really spoiled everything, I don't, things are upside, oh, upside down for now. President-elect Muhammadu Buhari is expected to review the subsidy scheme, which was revealed to have paid out over $6 billion in fraudulent claims in 2012. Leslie Marungu, CCTV. Now then, the fuel deal commits the current government, if it can't pay, to list all outstanding claims in a handover note to the incoming administration, led by the retired General Muhammadu Buhari. As it appears, incoming Nigerian president has in his entry pretty full. So we have agreed on the following. First is that the Minister of Finance will give an undertaking to... Uh, the major marketers and that man, that the work of that committee being headed by the CBN will be concluded. If it is concluded, PPPRA, yes, and CBN will be concluded in verifying those the outstanding claims. If it is concluded before the end of the life of it at this administration, it will be reflected in the handover notes. If it is not concluded before the end of the life of this administration, then the fact that such a committee is set up and working will be reflected in the handover note. Let's get the latest now from Desi Badmus. He's been covering this crisis for us from Lagos, Nigeria. He's got more on the deal that was arrived at. Um, Deji, walk us through the terms of the agreement arrived at between these two parties, the government and oil marketers. Well, thank you, Rama. What the oil marketers actually wanted was a commitment from this government, the government that... Uh, uh, the government now that uh, its tenure will be coming to an end on the 29th of May. Now, the marketers wanted a commitment from the government that uh, it is owing it 200 billion naira. That's about $1 billion. So it was that commitment the marketers were uh, actually looking for, and that's exactly what they got. And as you heard, uh, the chairman of the Senate Committee on uh, up and Upstream and Downstream say there, 
the marketers got um, the Minister of Finance to agree that, um, look, they are being owed this amount of money and that, of course, a committee had actually been set up by the CBN to verify if indeed uh, the 200 or $1 billion claim is actually true. That committee is still working. It has not turned in its report. The oil marketers wanted uh, the commitment of the government acknowledging the existence of that committee and that whenever that committee turned in its report, whether it turned in the report in the life of this administration or the next one, that it would be paid. And that's the commitment they've got. And that is basically the reason why they have resumed the supply of petroleum product, Rama. Indeed. We're still talking about commitments, however, here. The last deal broke down because the government failed to live up to its commitment. It didn't pay the oil marketers. So have OMCs gotten any collateral this time round to cover part or all of the $1 billion they're owed? Or are they just operating on the government's good word? Well, the, <laughs> there's no collateral. The collateral they have, the oil marketers have, is, of course, the commitment of the government, the words of the minister of finance, who is also known as a coordinating minister of the economy, Dr. Ngozi okonje -Wala. Now, what they want the government to actually do, or what they want the minister to do, is to reflect it in her handover note, that, look, they are being owed this amount of money, so that when the next government comes in, the next government will inherit it and then go ahead to pay them. So um, that's the collateral they want, uh, they actually want it, and that's, that's exactly what they got. And um, well, we still have to wait and see whether that committee is able to conclude its work before uh, Friday. If the committee is not able to conclude its work before Friday, I'm talking about the committee now that is supposed to verify the subsidy claims, then it means everything will be carried over to the next government. And since it's going to be reflected in the handover note, the next government will simply continue from where this government uh, would have stopped. All right, then. So clearly an emphasis here on continuity. Um, one last question for you, Deji, because for those of us who are not in Nigeria, this is laced with a lot of contradictions. Nigeria is Africa's biggest crude oil producer. There is a fuel shortage, but still there's a black market for fuel in the same country. Some people are using to get fuel to run their vehicles. Where's the fuel and supplies for that market coming from? <laughs> Very good question, Rama. <laughs> but to be candid, the, the fuel is basically coming from the oil marketers themselves. Just a few days ago, the Minister of Finance accused the marketers of not just blackmailing the country, but actually selling uh, their products in the black market where they make much, much money. So there's no question at all. Look, most of these filling stations that were shut down uh, before now actually had the product in they had the product in their facility, but they just shut down their operations. They refused to sell, but usually what they do is at night, very late at night, and sometime uh, early morning, say around 2 or 3 a.m., they sell to these black marketers who in turn take the fuel to the street to sell. So that's how most people were able, some people, I should say, were able to get fuel to run their cars and uh, some run their businesses. But Rama... You don't want to patronize these black marketers. You wouldn't believe it. Imagine uh, petrol that should be selling for 87 naira per liter going for as high as 500 naira per liter. You can imagine what that means. So you just don't want to patronize the black marketers, but at some point people just had no choice. They had to resort to buying from the black marketers. And that's the main reason why mm -hmm. a lot of people have said, look, there's every need to end this subsidy once and for all. If we could afford, if some people could afford to buy uh, for uh, 500 naira per liter, for God's sake, then end the subsidy and probably the price will just uh, probably come up to around 140 and that might just be fine. Mm -hmm. Indeed, we'll leave it there for the time being. It's actually painful just listening to those prices at Deji Badmus there live in Lagos, Nigeria. Now, we're still in West Africa. African countries are being urged to open up their borders to the free movement of people, goods, services and capital within the continent. That at least was a central theme of a session titled Africa Without Borders held in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire at the annual meetings of the African Development Bank. Delegates agree that simplifying visas will play a significant role in increasing Africa's competitiveness and regional integration as well. According to a recent study, Africans require visas to travel to at least half of the countries on the continent. Only 14 African countries offer liberal access to all African citizens, and that's for a variety of reasons. National security, fears both valid and invalid, 
about an influx of foreigners and financial returns from visa fees. Those are some of the reasons cited for the resistance by some governments to open up their borders. Now, financial inflows into the continent will rise by nearly 7% to about $193 billion this year, supported by a higher level of foreign direct investment and a spike in portfolio investment as well. That's according to the African Development Bank's Economic Outlook Report for Africa. Earlier on, I spoke to the bank's acting director of the research department, Dr. Abebe Shimeles, on these inflows. But I started our conversation by asking him about the risk of distress for African economies given the surge in dollar-denominated debt that has been issued from right here in Africa. Uh, we have just made the back of the envelope uh, estimate of the sovereign bond uh, and other debt African countries uh, hold. A large portion of it, 82 to 90 percent, is held in dollar denominated, uh, is, is, is denominated in U.S. dollars. A rise in the uh, exchange rate of the U.S. dollar against all other currencies imply uh, a larger payment uh, for these countries, increasing the debt stress. Um, what about uh, the question of how we manage this risk going forward? We've seen Ghana, for example, turning to the IMF for help. Are there, are not, are there, should we be concerned about other countries in Africa as well? Yes, actually, uh, we should be concerned. Um, like any other asset, uh, diversification is important to avoid uh, unforeseen shocks and its implication on debt and other financial holdings. Uh, so countries need uh, their own strategies of uh, diversifying the basket of uh, debt and other assets uh, they are holding. What sort of diversification would you suggest, Dr. Shimeles? Assuming, for example, the African Development Bank would advise these sovereign debt issuers, what would you tell them to do? Yeah, I mean, uh, as you know, U.S. dollar is not the only uh, hard currency in uh, the global economy. Uh, so depending on the trade structure and also the exposure risk of each country, they may need to have a resilient monetary policy to uh, resist and uh, absorb such shocks. Oftentimes, as you know, accumulating reserves helps uh, at the time of uh, uh, such unforeseen ris uh, currency risk, mm -hmm. uh, but also hedging, as, uh, probably uh, against unforeseen fluctuations in exchange rates. They can uh, uh, make the uh, uh, arrangements uh, in future payments uh, where uh, appropriate hedging can be found. So there are there are different financial instruments to protect countries from such uh, unforeseen risks. Indeed. Uh, let's move on to the question of portfolio investments. This was a key area of focus for the African Economic Outlook. Um, it did project that inflows will rise to about $193 billion. Uh, where exactly is this money going? Which markets are attracting the most volumes and why? Okay. Uh, in the report, we have identified two types of financial flows. Uh, the first one uh, is made up of FDI, Foreign Direct Investment, uh, Official Development Assistance and Remittances. Uh, and the other is also uh, Portfolio Investment, uh, investment going to uh, financial sector. Uh, if you are asking me about the portfolio investment, uh, the, the, uh, in the last year, for instance, we have seen a surge in uh, investment uh, to buy uh, financial instruments held by African companies and investment banks, uh, which is a good news. Uh, regarding the other financial flows like FDI, uh, oftentimes it goes mainly to the natural resources sector, especially the exploration and exploitation of oils and minerals. But then also we have seen a surge in remittances actually from a slow level of 60 billion to 67 billion. 
Right then, a quick run through the markets here for you. Another day of red ink across the board, with the exception, of course, of the Nigerian uh, markets. Hi, with regard to Kenya, this bear run has been very much in force for quite a while now, and it's being driven by a couple of factors. However, the key one among them is this dispute around the implementation of capital gains tax. It's still not clear exactly uh, what the amount of liability, rather, the stockbrokers do bear for not complying with the tax at the moment, and that is having a very big effect on these numbers. We're taking a short break here on Global Business Africa, but we'll be right back in 30. Effects of the austerity measures are evident and were expected. Egyptians, however, seem to be patient about it. But El Sisi told government he wants to control the prices promptly before people's patience runs out. Right then, welcome back to the program. You're still watching Global Business Africa right here from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Let's take you to East Africa. The Kenyan government has started negotiating the next stage of its multi-billion dollar standard gauge rail line project. The rail line essentially is designed to link Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda and South Sudan. It aims to improve operations and cut logistics costs right across borders. President Kenyatta met officials from the Chinese construction company, the China Roads and Bridges Company in South and Kenya, earlier today to discuss the project. The next stage of it will see the extension of the rail line from Nairobi to Naivasha, that's somewhere in central Kenya, following the completion of the line from Mombasa to Nairobi. The 120-kilometer extension will link planned industrial zones in Naivasha to Nairobi and Mombasa. President Kenyatta says he'll ensure the project is completed without delay. Now, the Russian-Egyptian business summit has ended in Cairo with a commitment from both sides to increase trade and investment between them. This was the largest ever Russian delegation to visit Egypt with 200 companies represented and 50 government officials. Yasser Kim attended the final day. He found this report. The forum's second day focused more on the business side rather than the official meetings of the opening session. Businessmen from both countries sat together to study offers for trade or investments. Agricultural products are the main component of bilateral trade. Egypt is the largest importer of wheat in the world and Russia is its biggest supplier. However, in return, Egyptian exporters are calling for facilities to have more access to the Russian market. We are requesting as Egypt that to involve more of the plant quarantines coming into Egypt and being involved in our the Russian plant quarantine being involved in Egypt and giving us more uh, thorough investigation to the operation the setup we do in Egypt in, in order to increase the uh, level of trust that Russian Federation will have with the Egyptian products coming from Egypt, especially on the agricultural products that we work in. Russian companies are visiting Egypt, citing the huge potential of the market if they invest here. We're looking for partners to represent us in Egypt and in the region with the aim of local production by assembling cranes in Egypt and distributing them to several markets from our base here. The highlight of the visit is the deal signed to fund mega projects in several sectors. We agreed to establish an investment fund that includes the Russian Foreign Investment Fund and the Abu Dhabi Fund in addition to several business institutions with the aim of direct investments in industrial, agricultural and service projects. This fund will raise at least $4 billion to be invested in Egypt. This business forum is not going to be the last. A joint committee has been established to follow up on the preliminary agreements and MIUs signed here. And there will also be a second set of meetings held in Cairo in the next few months. Yasser Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. Also, global collectors are scrambling to snap up Nigerian art as a new generation of artists attract attention worldwide. For a while now, they've been considered to be right at the forefront of the African contemporary art world. A Nigerian artist are now selling their work for hundreds of thousands of dollars. This artist is adding the finishing touches to his latest work. It is part of the Nigerian artist Tribal Mark series of giant portraits, all bearing the tribal scars on their faces. 
His giant works are produced in charcoals and pastels, and are so photorealistic they are regularly confused as produced by a camera and not human hand. The idea for the child came to me from walking on the street and seeing kids run around at play, or hawking, like going around on errands for their parents. And I felt, I felt a strong connection to the work by the time I was done. He has come a long way since he sold his first portrait for 1,100 naira, or six US dollars. Seven years later, one of his charcoal renderings sold for 2.45 million naira, or 12,300 US dollars. It's not just about documenting travel marks. When I see portraits done by um, Europeans, Americans, Nigerians, they do portraits of public figures, people, you know, Hollywood stars, etc. Those people are beautiful to them. But the people beautiful to me are the people I see every day. People I see on the bus, the person I buy, where Ted come from, the bus conductor, the just a random man on the street, someone I'll see now and I'll never see again in my lifetime. The 24-year-old success is only part of the huge global rise and rise in the value of modern and contemporary African art that is being described as the new scramble for Africa. Nigeria has been at the forefront, certainly, of African contemporary and, African, and modern art as well. So post-45, post-war art, certainly in the modern sector, it is the leader because be honest, it was the only one that had the artists and the art structure at that time. A lot of the other African countries didn't have it. It's been one of the best kept secrets about Nigeria, the vibrancy, the depth and the breadth of art. But of course we can then define what does that art mean. But I, to me, I don't think it's sudden. I think one has to put it within the context of the growing interest in all things African and in uh, just making sure that the full picture of what is happening on the continent in the economic space, including the creative market, uh, gets attention. Nigeria is the continent's biggest oil producer with the largest economy and population, and now it is leading the art field too. Yuan Yani, CCTV. Quick run through commodity prices at GLUT that we kept on talking about right here on this program with regard to crude oil still very much in force. Partly the reason you're seeing those numbers on your screen right now, crude oil well under $64 a barrel. But remember, of course, while it still is your friend, if you're trading on this side of the equation, uh, that, of course, might change and you might see crude prices heading back up depending on where sentiment drives it. We'll be in Senegal next, introducing you to a set of enterprising female entrepreneurs. Their stories coming up shortly. Welcome back. Now, Senegal has one of those absolutely envious distinctions of being one of the most stable democracies and economies as well across Africa. The thing is, though, it's not all a rosy story. Poverty is widespread and employment is also fairly high. Businesswomen in the country are on a drive to change that, however. They're using entrepreneurship to foster economic development. Lesni Mirungu has more. Kasaman's women in Senegal are known for their strong spirit of entrepreneurship. They transform raw agricultural products into commodities that are sold on the market. Thanks to this production unit, we can take care of ourselves. We are independent because of our labor. We work night and day. Right now we have a lot of products. In this plant we transform fruits and vegetables such as cashews, coconuts, ginger, mangoes, tamarind, lemon, bisap, carrots, cauliflower and turnips. We transform them into jam, marmalade and syrup. We want to develop this region. 
We want to develop Kasamans because it's our region. And I'm really proud to create jobs, especially for women, because we suffered a lot in Kasamans because of the conflict. I want to employ more women, up to 1,000 or even unlimited, if God gives me the courage and the opportunity to do so. Another economic activity is oyster farming. It has been identified as a key sector for sustainable development growth. Female farmers exploit the mangrove resources through oyster harvesting. They work to preserve the ecosystem by planting new mangroves to foster greater biodiversity. We have been farming oysters for five years in Kasamansi. It's a very profitable business. We're training other women in order to allow them to become more self-reliant. About 50 women work in the sector of apiculture. They are grouped in eight processing units set up by the program to support the economic development of Kasamans. This activity creates jobs because if you look at the rural areas in general, women lack income generating activities. Therefore, this beekeeping activities allows women to generate income and to even improve living conditions in their villages. At the Sarsaoma production unit, women here produce almost between 10 to 15 tons of honey per year, therefore making sales revenue of about 10 to 15 million. Consequently, apiculture is a sector that really contributes to poverty reduction in Casamans. Casamans women entrepreneurs hope to get modern facilities which will help them get access to international markets. I have been working for 10 years in this honey process plant. I am happy because I was out of work. Today, thanks to this activity, I'm able to respond to my family needs. Leslie Murungu, CCTV. Right then, let's wrap up with a look at the currencies. Not much to report here, but a weakness coming through on the South African Rand. But the real story really is all in the Kenyan shilling. 97.80 uh, was one of the numbers that we closed at high, but we did hit 98.50 at some point in trading. So in the retail side, however, Kenyans here already paying 100 on the sell side for a uh, retail rate. So this, of course, has raised quite a few issues. And remember, at this point, we still don't have a substantive central bank governor, Dr. Sirmo Silla, in an acting capacity at the moment. That's it for this edition of the program. As always, we welcome your thoughts, your ideas, story tips, feedback on what we do around here. Global Business Africa at cctv.com is the email address to use. As always, Facebook and Twitter are your ports of call when we are not on air. We'll see you in 23 hours. I'm Ramanyan.